Welcome to Western Truth Radio. If you are still listening on our WTTV audiobook channel, we extend our gratitude. We kindly request you to subscribe to Western Truth Radio for upcoming audiobook publications by our esteemed team. Western Truth Radio can be found in the video description and is pinned as the top post. We earnestly anticipate the arrival of our listeners to our platform in the near future. Books of this caliber, such as the one presented tonight, will no longer be available for upload on this channel. Without any further delay, let us proceed with tonight's program from Western Truth Radio and Western Truth TV. And without further ado us for, Breaking Free, an M&M Romance Audiobook. Part 1 Beck sat on the warm couch in the small room. Across from him, his therapist sat cross-legged with a mug of sweet-smelling tea warming her fingers. Beck clutched a pillow to his chest, resting his chin on the pillow for support as he studied the abstract pattern of the carpet. It's good to see you, Beck. How have you been? Deborah, the therapist smiled at him. His eyes floated up to her face, focusing on her faded blonde eyebrows behind her cat eye glasses. Fine. He mumbled, eating up minutes with his delayed response which was better than the responses she received for the first three months of sessions. Beck visited Deborah in her modern home twice a week. Sometimes he talked, sometimes he didn't. Sometimes he picked the threads of her antique couch, begging her to show annoyance but she never did. Five months into the twice-a-week sessions, Beck prompted conversation. He told her it was cold in the room and asked if it were possible to change the setting on the thermostat. He flinched when she stood to honor his request. After, silence drowned him again. Deborah came armed with her own thoughts, watching Beck with an endless supply of patience despite his lack of responses. She studied him and despite his lack of eye contact, he studied her. Convinced she was trustworthy, he relented, answering her introductory question and winding around to real conversation. How has your week been? She ventured further, curling into her seat and bunching silvery hair resting on her shoulders. Better. I finished high school this week. Congratulations, Beck. How long did it take you, six months? Eight, actually. We've been seeing each other for eight months. It seems so much shorter. Deborah lamented, taking a slow sip of her tea. Have you thought about the future? Yes. I rushed to finish the coursework to gain admittance to the local community college for freshman courses. Beck hugged the pillow tighter. Good idea. Community college is affordable, and you can always transfer to a university later, even in the middle of the semester if you would like. I read it can be a waste to start at a university because the first two years you take introductory classes. Pretty much. Deborah shrugged her agreement. What are you going to major in? I am not sure yet. I like art. Toby suggested take a lot of different courses and decide later. Are you going to do that? Probably. The conversation lapsed into silence. Deborah waited until it was clear Beck was done with the conversation before prompting a new one. Do you want to talk about Toby? Um. Sure. What about him? Tell me about him. His, nice. I mean. He's really nice. He never gets mad and we have fun doing things together. Beck's stormy expression cleared. The first night after everything, he bought burgers, so we have burgers every Saturday and whenever I'm upset. And he offered the master bedroom to me, too, even though it's his room. Did you take it? No, but I take showers and baths in there sometimes. I have my own room across the hall the second biggest room with a private bathroom. It's nice. Oh, and I have a new work room. Today he's with his friends moving in new furniture. To your new work room? Yes. We purchased a desk, easel, art supplies, furniture, of course. He waved a hand, leaning back into the couch. Ah. How would you describe your relationship with Toby? I'm not sure. What do you mean? I'm not sure how I would describe our relationship. Beck paused. More than a friendship. Is there a romantic aspect to your relationship? We spend time together one-on-one -on -one a lot. Eating and movies. We also spend time with his friends a lot. 
I don't have friends yet. Well, Toby's friends count as your friends, don't they? I suppose, yes. They are nice people, even when you're alone with them. As they are supposed to be. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, however, is there an intimate aspect to your relationship? Yes, no. Not really? His easy expression slipped into a frown. We hold hands sometimes. Sometimes we kiss. Sometimes I sit in his lap and he holds me, like when we're relaxing. We don't have sex. Oh, okay. Do you like this relationship with Toby? I do, but I'm afraid he may not. Why? Because he never wants to have sex with me. Have you guys ever had sex or talked about having sex? And no. Not since the first time. The first time? A flash of polite curiosity sparked Deborah's eyes, the thrill of seeing a client bloom. The first time. When we first met. He, Beck's words broke off. I, we had sex after the fight and the money. Would you like to take us back to when you first met? I'm not ready. Voice trembling, he turned shining green eyes to Deborah. Tears glistened at the corners of his eyes, threatening to slide down his smooth cheeks. Deborah offered him tissue. Take your time. He blotted the corners of his eyes, took in a deep breath, and exhaled. Fingers folded and refolded the damp tissue. We met at a party. Like a coming out party, I guess. Me and three other girls, it was our turn to, to be presented to the world. I had on nicer clothing than I'd ever put on in my life. The shirt was soft against my skin and the pants. The shoes pinched my toes, but I couldn't be barefoot. And this custom corset vest laced up. I can't imagine how much daddy spent on the whole thing. Who is daddy? Daddy is the man who owned us, me and the other girls. He owned everything and told us what he expected from us. What did he expect from you? Obedience, always. He was a mean. He told each of us if we didn't make at least a million dollars on our coming out night, we were worthless to him and to the person who bought us. I see. So, you have the shirt and the vest and the pants and then what? I was nervous and scared, but I needed to market myself, to flirt with men so later they will want to bid. I was flirting, actually getting rather inebriated, and a fight broke out over a cheating card game and Toby pulled me away from the fray. The first thing he does when you meet is get you to a safe spot. Yes. Then we talked. We hid in this secret roof spot of mine and talked until it was time for bidding. I thought he knew why he was there, but, but I don't think he did. Hum? Why not? His face. When he saw me up there and naked. He was so mad. He was mad at you? No, mad at daddy, I think. He bid. Toby did. Up to the cap. How much was the cap? Twenty-five million dollars. This other man and Toby wouldn't break the tie, so they had to fight and then the winner had to have sex with me in front of everyone. The rules, they were made so men would be encouraged to break the tie before going further but Toby wasn't budging. The rules are so primitive. Men fighting and public sex. I, I was afraid he wouldn't do it because it's so weird. But he did it? How did it make you feel? Good. I felt good. Not during because it hurt since it was my first time, but before and after. Once I knew I was his, I felt relieved. And, I don't know, he's nice and very cute. Beck blushed, lifting his shoulders to hide his ears. Have you talked to him about the night you met? No. He doesn't bring it up and neither do I. Like I said, I don't think, I mean I'm not sure of what we are. Do you think maybe you should have a relationship discussion with him? I, I guess I could. It makes me nervous. Discussing your relationship with him makes you nervous? Yes, because what if he doesn't want the same thing as me? What if I want a full relationship and he likes what we have now? Or what if he thinks I'm disgusting? You never know until you ask. Deborah's words were soothing though inconclusive. True. Beck sighed, glancing at the clock as the second lapse in conversation began. Deborah did the same from the watch on her wrist. 
Is there anything else you would like to discuss? We have a few more minutes. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking about everything and I don't know what would have happened if Toby hadn't been there. Daddy, Beck's eyebrows crunched together, Daddy's killed someone before for not making enough money. He said it was easier to give a man a million dollars than to give him a worthless whore and he shot her. On the platform. I thought about it, about seeing her fall backwards, when I was on the stage. And he kept trying to show me off. I hate how my body responds independent of my mind. I got excited when daddy touched me, my body did. But all I wanted was for him to go away. It's biological. Nerves respond to touch, but just because your body responded doesn't mean you consented to the touch. He would praise me for it and tell me all the different ways I could please a man. A and we practiced everything but the sex because he wanted me pure. I don't know if I want Toby to know these things if he doesn't. I wish I didn't know them. Understandable, but you do and it's okay to know these things. I guess. It's not useful knowledge. I should have gone to school and learned things and read books. All the stuff I learned over the last eight months, I should have learned as a child. You are right. It's not fair. Beck scowled, ending the conversation. Deborah nodded. You are right, again. I think we've covered a lot today, a lot of good thinking. Yeah, but no solutions. Oh, we had one solution, I believe. Are you going to talk to Toby about your relationship with him? I, yes. Yes, I should so I will. Am I supposed to forget my past? Because now I'm angry. What were you before? Repressed. I didn't want to think about it. Since I have, I'm angry. Kids aren't supposed to learn the proper way to please a man. They're supposed to learn math. Deborah nodded, anger is good. It's the process to healing and acceptance. One day I'll stop being angry? Possibly. Acceptance doesn't mean a lack of anger, it only means acceptance. It is a high calling to ask you to not be angry. How long does it take for acceptance? Deborah shrugged, there's no set time frame. Eventually. Eventually. All right. One corner of Beck's lips quirked up and he stood to his feet, resting the pillow back where he found it on the corner of Deborah's couch. He adjusted his jeans, tucking the long hem of his shirt into his front pocket as Deborah abandoned her tea and stood with him. Remember, next week we have to cancel because I will be out of town for a conference. However, the following week, we're on for Tuesday and Thursday as always. I can't wait to hear about your first week of school. She promised, volunteering the reminder of stability. Of course. And I am paid up, right? Indeed. You have two more sessions before you need to pay again. Perfect. Okay. They worked their way from her office, through her living room and back to the front door where Beck could see Tobias leaning against a dirty silver hatchback, the sun kissing his skin and forming a delicate halo around him. Oh, one more thing. Beck snapped his fingers right as his other hand touched the door knob. Yes? Do you do, like, group sessions? If maybe Toby and I wanted to have a session together? I'm not saying we will, just wondering if that's something you could do. Of course. It's a little more expensive for two people per hour, but if he only comes occasionally, then I'll keep it at your regular rate. Good to know. Okay, thanks. Have fun at your conference. Beck even waved as he walked backwards down her winding walkway. Beck's features relaxed into his youth, lines of worry fading as a light smile touched his lips. The cathartic nature of therapy worked its magic, opening an infected wound to start the healing process. He stopped in front of Tobias. Oh, hi. He teased, smile growing to touch his eyes. Oh, hey. Tobias flashed his own dazzling smile. How was therapy? Actually, it was good. As opposed to, fine, which had been the answer for the first few trying sessions when Deborah walked an aimless beck halfway down the walkway, relinquishing responsibilities to Tobias who led him back to the car. Yeah? I'm glad you like it. I figured, you know, you need someone besides me to talk to. Tobias reminded him, 
those words ingrained in Beck's memory from months of hearing it. Hum. I agree. Beck giggled, standing on his toes to kiss Tobias' cheek. He brushed past him to open his car door and get inside before the other man could comment on the affection, leaving Tobias blushing and embarrassed outside his car. He shuffled to the driver's side and climbed in as Beck pulled his phone out of his pocket and surveyed it. He had no friends to message, no family to call, but he enjoyed the mindlessly simple games. Hey, listen. Tobias touched the back of Beck's seat. I know we usually get burgers, but the boys are at the house and they were wondering if we could get pizza for them. They are waiting on the last bit of furniture to be delivered. Charles is supervising. If you want burgers, we can get burgers you and I and bring a pizza, no, no it's fine. Beck smiled, pizza is fine, really, but can we talk about something first? Awesome. Oh, yeah, anything. What's on your mind? Tobias turned the key in the ignition and the car groaned awake. He merged into the neighborhood road and navigated them back to the main roads, stealing private looks to Beck when he could. Well. Deborah and I talked about a lot of things. About the night we met and us. He paused, exhaling slowly, and I was wondering what kind of relationship we have. Ah, uh, well. Good question. Tobias turned onto the major highway, taking them from the south part of town back to the east where Tobias lived. What kind of relationship do you want? I want you to want to have sex with me. W what? I do want to have sex with you? Then why do we never have sex? Because I figured you should talk about what happened and everything. And because, I don't know, I'm not ready yet. You're not ready? What are you waiting for? Beck glared at Tobias who returned his gaze with a confused expression. Me? I mean, I'm just waiting. I don't know, fuck. I'm waiting on myself to get over what happened between us, okay? I'm waiting to come to terms with having to rape you to get you the hell out of there and into a better life. And seeing your face when you were scared I wouldn't do it. I'm waiting for my mind to stop reliving it. You think about it? All the time, Beck. I'm mad at myself for doing it, but I replay it and I don't see any other option. I could have refused, you know, because it was rape, but then you'd be with the other guy now. You probably wouldn't be in therapy you wouldn't have a GED, you wouldn't be going to college. It wasn't rape. I wanted you to, it can't be rape when I wanted it. It can be rape if you wanted it for the wrong reasons, if you were manipulated into thinking you had no other choice, if you were under emotional distress. It's something I can't return to you, whoever you were before I did what I did. Toby, you don't have to feel guilty about it, okay? I wanted it. I wanted you to do whatever it took to get me out of there and when you were next to me I felt safe. The first time when you grabbed my arm to even the last time when we were in front of the crowd. I can't not feel guilty. Your first time isn't supposed to be in front of a bunch of people or sold to any disgusting bidder out there. Fuck. Tobias cursed again, strong hands squeezing the steering wheel. The old leather creaked under his grip. It's, it's not. You're right. Beck flinched when Tobias' hands worked the steering wheel. But you can't be upset at yourself forever. I don't think of it the way you do. To me, sometimes we have to do what's necessary for survival. Did you know in some bird species the mother has two chicks, but will eventually pick the stronger one and let the other die? Is she a murderer, or is she doing what she must do to keep something she cares about safe? Tobias drove in silence, miles passing as he stewed over Beck's example. She has no other choice. She can't feed two babies, if she tries to feed them both, they will both die. You could have told Daddy no, you won't do it, but then I would be with the other man and you would be wondering if you should have made a different move. Beck forged on, determined to support his theory with facts and circumstantial evidence. Fine. Then. I still need time to know you're really okay before we go there again. Go where? Before we think about having sex. I want to do the second time how your first time should have been. Special, with no expectations attached and absolutely no one else watching. I will cancel the cleaning lady for the day and tell the driver to go home. 
it will be us, just you and I for the entire night, weekend, however long. Oh, Beck blushed. He blushed deeper, goosebumps puckering his skin. I, I approve this idea. Eh, so you want to be with me? I've wanted to be with you since the first time our eyes met, and you knocked over my beer and guessed my replacement. I need a title. For our relationship. Boyfriends, if you want. I am with no one else and I don't want to be with anyone else, either. But I understand if you want something different. Boyfriends? So, when someone asks me who you are to me, I can say you are my boyfriend. Even though we don't have sex. Yes. Yes. Sure. There are a lot of intimate things besides sex. Sleeping together, holding hands, cuddling. We don't do a lot of those things. We can, if you want to. Tobias pulled into Tony's, the local pizza place, parking his car right out front. The automatic lights from the car shined into the clear display glass. Do you want to? Yes. Very much. Okay. But remember, I still need more time for the next step. I want to take it slow, no rules or set limits. I think we'll know when we're ready, right? Yeah. I think so, too. I'll wait here while you get the pizza. Beck waved him on and then sat back. Tobias strolled inside, hips shifting with a natural swagger. He exchanged several crumpled bills and a handful of coins for a stack of four pizza boxes, two smaller boxes, and a bag of soft drinks. Tobias put everything in the back seat on his return. And beer? Oh shit, yeah. Beer, too. I'll stop at the corner store by the house for it. Tobias blushed. The rest of the ride was uneventful besides Beck achieving new levels on his game and Tobias singing and head bobbing to the majority of the songs on the popular radio station. Beck appreciated the normalcy. At the corner store, Beck stayed in the car again, but he couldn't watch Tobias from the inside. The first week of them living together, Beck refused to be out of Tobias' sight when they weren't home. This meant even simple stops required a pair of two going inside and coming back out. Tobias never complained. Beck had graduated to staying in the car as Tobias pumped gas, as Tobias ran inside for just one thing, and then in general while occupied with something else. Tobias returned with two six-packs of beer and two tall cans of iced tea for Beck. The boys were at the car as they pulled up. Smash grinned and waved, muscles stretching over his broad chest. Hey guys. He leaned against Beck's door, deep voice greeting them with a cheery smile. Primed for hard labor, both Smash and Tiger had their shirts tucked in the belt loop of their jeans, the sun kissing their bare chest. Beck. Coleman told me you're starting at the community college Monday? Tiger, Tobias, and Charles gathered the food and drinks. Charles grabbed the beers while Tobias and Tiger split collecting the pizzas and soft drinks, carrying it all inside as they talked about the game later, the arrangement of furniture, and cars. Tiger opened the car door for Beck. Thank you. Yes. I am. He slinked past Smash's big body, patting his shoulder. You heard correctly. Yeah, yeah. Smash gathered Beck's tea before closing the car door and trailing behind him. Well, I go part-time when I'm not training. I'm going for a business associate degree and maybe some other skills later. Ah, I see. I am not sure what I'm going for, yet. Ah, uh, art. Considering all the stuff we moved up a flight of stairs for you today, you better be doing something with art. Canvases and easels and junk are heavy. A deep chuckle vibrated Smash's throat. He put Beck's tea in the refrigerator. Hum, and you're pretty good. I like the abstract stuff you do. It's really, what's the word, poignant? They're depressing? Not the right word. Smash quirked his eyebrows and flashed another bright smile in his nervousness. Beck inherited a family of large, shy men when he came home with Tobias. Smash was his favorite because of his boundless energy, easy nature, and intelligence. They discussed books and classic literature while Tobias and Tiger didn't bother reading. Tiger was a food connoisseur and enjoyed badgering Beck to accompany him to every new restaurant opening. 
Charles and Beck's relationship was quiet and respectful, which was surprising for Charles' careless nature. He was the second emergency contact on his phone, and he'd seen Beck through stressful tears and emotional shutdowns. H.M. They're touching? They're immersive. It hurts to look, but you want to know more. I see. Stick with business school. Beck's green eyes glittered at his own tease. Show me my new studio? Yeah, of course. I think the guys are setting up for the game. You watching with us? Of course. I wouldn't miss an MMA match even if I had the choice. Who doesn't want to watch sweaty men tackle each other in tiny shorts? Hum. As Beck griped about mixed martial arts, he shuddered. Guess you're in? Smash laughed. Enough. Convince Toby to do a local fight again. He's so sexy when he fights. Ah. Uh, I'll do what I can, but don't call my coach sexy. It's weird. Smash bounded up the stairs, skipping every other step to get to the top in half the time. Beck took each step. But he is sexy. Dude, he's my coach. He punches me in the face. There's nothing sexy about it. His face when he does it? Beck's eyelashes fluttered. He flicked on the light to the fifth and previously empty bedroom. His new home studio included grey-painted walls with inspirational clippings covering one wall and his own drying paintings on another. The longest wall in the room was a pegboard he spent weeks painting as oversized abstract pixel art. The pegboard had containers to keep his more expensive supplies from getting lost. A tub sink occupied a corner of the room, and various lengths of tables and easels spanned the space. Beck insisted on the purchase of one portable easel and one wooden heavy easel. Likewise, he had a table easel, a wooden chair, a music entertainment system, and a vintage cushioned chair. We tried to arrange it how you'd want it or something. Coleman said you drew something out for us. He pulled his jeans up by one belt loop though they sagged back down to his hips, displaying tight briefs hugging his waist. I can have him change a few things around later. Otherwise. It's perfect. Thanks for helping. Beck hugged Smash's neck. Hey, it's no problem. It's nice having you around. You're like, a little sassy brother. Millimeter, Beck kissed Smash's cheek. Good. I'm going to shower and change. Before you settle in for beer and pizza, can you grab my drinks from downstairs and take them up to the game room? Sure thing, kid. Smash rustled Beck's hair. Beck pushed him back with a giggle and moved into Tobias' bedroom to shower. The men were already gathered in the game room, listening to pre-game information, talking about the players. Beck rooted for one of Tobias' worn shirts, lying it on the bed to wear after his shower. When he wanted a shower, he used his own bathroom. When he wanted to be enveloped by the steam and take time for himself, he used Tobias. The rainwater and glass door cloaked him with fog, allowing him the privacy to release the day's pent-up emotions. The shower water on his face was a catalyst and a disguise for his own tears. The therapist told him crying was okay, crying was the building block to healing, so he let himself cry for as long as he needed to. Once his tears stopped flowing, he finished his shower, lathering with organic bath soaps, washing his thick curls with shampoo formulated for his hair. He collapsed into Tobias' bed after his shower, tuning into the men's voices again. The rise and fall of voices lulled him into a short nap, but the announcer's booming voice jolted him awake. His brain refused to forget Daddy's cold voice. He knuckled his eyes, tugging Tobias' shirt over his wet hair and slight frame. He settled for boxer briefs on his bottom half and skipped down the hall to the game room. Ah, hey. Just in time for the match. Tobias' warm voice greeted Beck first. He stood up to approach, kissing Beck's clean skin with a soft sigh. We saved pizza and breadsticks for you. Smash put your tea in the mini refrigerator. It's lightweight championships. Hey, Beck. Charles wiggled his beer in Beck's direction, sitting in the lone chair. Hey YA, bro. Tiger mumbled around a big bite of pizza. He occupied the love seat on his own, making Tobias and Smash share the couch. Hey guys. Beck leaned into Tobias, waving at Charles and chuckling at Tiger. 
he kissed Tobias' shoulder, squeezing his hand. Go sit and watch the match. I'll join you in a moment. Beck whispered. Tobias returned to his seat while Beck puttered around, grabbing one iced tea and a paper plate from the unused stack. He put two slices of pizza and one breadstick on his plate and walked around behind the couch to avoid disturbing the beginning of the match. He slipped into Tobias' lap, curling to rest his plate on his knees and his head on Tobias' shoulder. Tobias smiled. His arms wrapped around Beck's torso, petting down his back. Tobias nibbled Beck's leftover pizza crusts as he explained move after move to Smash and Tiger. The game was a lesson as much as it was entertainment. The second round, he let Smash call the moves and dictate how the fighter achieved success without leaving it to luck. The third round was Tiger's turn. Beck called time after the sixth replay of the fight, showing Smash, Tiger, and Drunk Charles to the exit. After a chaste goodnight kiss, Beck parted ways with Tobias in the hallway. Tobias disappeared in his room, leaving the door cracked. Beck stepped into his bedroom, doing the same before crawling into bed for sleep. Part 2 Monday came too soon for Beck, who found himself in a nervous frenzy Sunday night. After spending the entire day purchasing books, clothes, getting a new haircut and making sure he had more than enough school supplies, he still ran through the house checking and rechecking items. Beck and Tobias printed the class schedule on the campus map and charted the best routes from class to class. They discussed options for between class downtime and if his class ended up cancelled. They discussed contingency plans for those plans. After a run around the block, Beck settled enough to shower and prepare for bed, kissing Tobias goodnight and retiring to his room. He woke early on Monday even though his first class wasn't until 11 o'clock. Tobias grumbled awake when he heard Beck take another shower, stumbling into the bathroom to piss. Morning, Dot. He rumbled. Beck blinked and looked over, eyes wide. He closed them, scrubbing his face clear of soap and splashing steamy water afterwards. Good morning. Beck turned the water off and wrapped a fluffy towel around his torso, tucking it closed. He stepped out of the shower onto the mat, drying his toes, and slithered past Tobias brushing his teeth. You're up early. Yeah. Heard you in the shower. S okay. I can do some work. Go for a run or something. What time is Smash picking you up? My first class is at 11 and his is at 11.30, so the plan is for him to be here at 10, leaving plenty of time for traffic and natural disasters and floods. It's never flooded here. It could still happen. Beck rubbed the towel over his wet skin, blotting his long curls dry. True. Better to be prepared. Tobias chuckled, watching Beck from the bathroom mirror as he dried off and then moisturized his skin. Correct. Then I will wait in front of my class for Smash to be finished and we will have lunch before our next class. Mine is at 1.30 and his is at 2. After, we will meet you at the gym for his practice. Sounds exciting. I hope you are assigned lots of homework. For these two classes, the syllabus is available online. I could start the homework early, but it's mostly reading. Tomorrow I'm worried because I have math and this weird public speaking course. It's required. But I have art, too. Beck chattered through his schedule for the tenth time as Tobias finished his bathroom habits and exited the bathroom behind Beck. Beck wiggled into hip-hugging skinny jeans, the smallest of Tobias' shirts, and a pair of heeled ankle boots the department store worker refused ring Beck up for. The boots rooted his slender frame to the ground. He surveyed himself in Tobias' full-length mirror, fussing with his wild curls. He lost the battle of order but won the battle of freeze and settled for a fishtail braid resting on his shoulder. Yeah. Tobias mumbled, throwing on a shirt and exchanging boxers for joggers. You mind if I go for a run? I'll be back in 30 minutes to make breakfast. Of course not. I'll read. Beck collected the necessary school textbooks, two spiral notepads, and his shoulder bag and went downstairs after Tobias. He set his supplies by the door and settled in the downstairs main room, reading while Tobias ran, returned, and even cooked breakfast. The books Beck had access to as a child were fantasies, worn copies of pulp fiction books printed on the cheapest paper available. 
his textbooks were different. They were anthologies, collections of classic works in an expert order and in original format with footnotes. Deciphering Chaucer Ian English by side margin notes took longer to comprehend than an updated ghost story, but Beck loved every minute of it. The short works transported him to another time, one that existed in the world and not the fantastical minds of their creators. Eggs, bacon, and grits. Tobias lowered an intricately designed plate to the side table and sat on the couch to eat his breakfast from a bowl. Beck caught a wave of Tobias' sweaty scent as he leaned forward. It stopped him cold, ice sliding down his spine. Tobias smelled of salt and his own natural spices, pepper and mint. He pressed his lips into Beck's, teasing Beck with his tongue. Only the tip extended past their lips and then stroked the underside Beck's tongue before retreating. Shivering, Beck pushed against Tobias. T thank you. Beck blushed, ducking his head as he reached for his plate. Sorry. I need to shower still. And no. You're fine. You smell fine. Beck nibbled his bacon in favor of more justifications. He ate each piece of the meal, the bacon first, then the scrambled eggs, then the buttery grits. Breakfasts were strictly rice and chicken as a child, the same as lunches and dinners. Tobias never made rice. Beck waited for Smash outside, pacing the driveway until Smash's old pickup rolled up behind Tobias' hatchback, and then he jumped in, settling his bag at his feet. They drove in silence, Smash still waking up from a late night and Beck nervous for his first day around hundreds of strangers his own age. They arrived on campus in record time, and Beck was the first one to arrive at his lecture hall. He was so early the class before his was still in session. Smash waited with him until the previous class dismissed, but once Beck found a safe seat in the middle of the room, Smash left for his own class. Students trickled in, getting more plentiful as it came closer to class time. The professor, flanked by two younger women, stalked in through a hidden doorway on the side of the lecture podium. The classroom was a lecture hall, designed to seat hundreds of students, and by the time the professor took the podium and tapped the microphone, all but a few seats were occupied. Good morning, class. I'm Professor Knight. Like the night sky and I will be your professor for English 201. This class is an introduction to classic European literature. We will cover Chaucer, Shakespeare, Hugo, Tolstoy. You will all be divided into smaller private discussion groups which will meet on Fridays to review the information we talk about in this lecture. My two assistants are, Ms. Donna Winters and Ms. Sarah Eglin. Beck scribbled notes on top of his printed syllabus while the other students stared at Professor Knight with glassy eyes as he continued in a droning voice. The professor reviewed the syllabus in detail, explaining the format of their exams, the format of their three essays, and then the optional final exam. If they found themselves with less than A-B average come final exams, they were required to take the test. If their average grade was A-B or higher, the exam was optional. Some students cheered. Beck fretted. The professor opened the floor for questions and after one girl asked if they had assigned seats, a boy asked if the exams would be closed or open notes, and another girl asked when they would know their group discussion classes, they were dismissed with 15 minutes left to the 45-minute session. Beck sat outside the classroom until Smash loped back down the hallway an hour later. How was it? He dumped his bag next to Beck and sat down, relacing his sneakers as Beck spoke. A blonde girl waved at Smash and blushed when he returned the wave. And then another girl, this one with brown hair and then another girl with frizzy curls. Beck looked at Smash. Are you a local celebrity? Kinda? I win a lot of local fights, so I guess people know my name, or at least my face. Of course. I forgot. They are cute. You're single, you should talk to someone. I've been thinking about it, but I don't have a lot of time for dating between school and practice, you know. If I'm going to date a girl, I want to do it right not put her on the back burner until I've had my whole life and she's just been waiting. True, but maybe she'll be okay with waiting? You should at least give it a chance. Yeah, I guess. You sick of me bothering you, huh? No. I want you to be happy. What if I like being single? You like touching yourself? Beck rose his eyebrows. 
Smash grinned, a dimple showing on one cheek. Nor. Okay. I see your point. Come on let's get lunch. Smash carried both of their bags to the small student union and ate twice as much food as Beck in half the time. The cafeteria served fried chicken and mashed potatoes, or hamburgers with fries. The salad bar was towards the left side and the drink station towards the right. Smash ordered both the chicken and the hamburger and made a small salad. Beck reluctantly ordered the chicken and mashed potatoes, leaving three of the five chicken strips on his plate. Smash picked at Beck's leftovers as they discussed their classes and instructors. Beck stifled giggles as Smash told him how distracting his old professor's nose hairs were, how they moved with every inhale and vibrated on every exhale. Smash completed the tale with an impression of the man, pushing invisible glasses up his nose and looking down with a long face. Smash pretended to read an open book, dragging every word in a monotone voice. Full and smiling, Beck walked to his next class with Smash strolling beside him. The second lecture was similar to the first, but for an American history class. There were less papers, only two exams, but the information was all new to Beck. Most of the students groaned when the professor reviewed the major topics of the class. One girl whispered her tales of woe to the boy next to her. He wore an equally grim expression to American history before the Civil War. Beck, however, flipped through the crisp white pages of his textbook, skimming pages with pictures of brown people to pictures of pale people overdressed for their new world. Unlike the first professor, Professor Westmoreland launched into lecture after he finished with the syllabus, voice wrapped with excitement. He flicked through detailed slides as he elaborated on every small bullet point. Beck struggled for ten minutes trying to write every word he said. For the last ten, he copied the slides into his notebook and added small notions around it. The second method appeared less organized, but Beck preferred it over his struggling before. Tuesday he had three classes, math, public speaking, and art. The math professor, Jerry, was a young hipster who strode into class with a purpose. He dropped a book and a calculator on the desk and leaned on the side of it, arms folded, as he informed the class of their four exams. He said most of their classes would be short and to the point, because he didn't want to stay any longer than he had to, and he knew all of them were busy with other professors assigning three years' worth of work in one semester. All in all, math class lasted five minutes and gave Beck nearly two hours to fret over public speaking. Those hours passed quicker than average and, with a wrung out hem, Beck entered the small classroom and sat down. Mrs. Porter, the public speaking professor, bumbled into the classroom with a whirlwind of papers and writing tools somehow attached to her person. Her frizzy hair trapped a pencil and a pen, sticky notes coated her small tablet and crumpled papers peeked from inside her tote bag. The opposite of Jerry, Mrs. Porter started her first class right then. She clapped and wiggled her fingers. Everybody up, up and in a circle. Beck fussed with his bag and then his clothes as he moved over to his peers, standing between a short, sporty girl and a tall round boy. Now, we're all going to go around the room and introduce ourselves and say our favorite color. I will go first. I'm Mrs. Porter and my favorite color is neon orange. She touched the shoulder of the girl beside her. Amy's favorite color was teal, as was Kimi's, Kara's, Penelope's, and Manda M.S. The sporty girl next to Beck liked the color purple and went by Coco even though her name was Rebecca. She looked at Beck. Ah. Uh. H. Hi. My name is Beck. Beck, um, Coleman. He blushed, feeling everyone's eyes heavy on him. My favorite color is hazel. Um. Light brown. His heart raced as the tall boy next to him introduced himself. He was Brent and his favorite color was also brown. Mrs. Porter beamed at them all as the last girl stammered through her greeting similar to Beck. The bouncy professor clapped her hands again. Awesome. It's good to meet you all and I know we'll get to know each other so much better as the semester continues. For now, let's play some icebreaker games. She dug in her orange tote bag, pulling out a yarn ball. For this game, I will toss this ball of yarn to someone and ask them a question about themselves. After they answer, they toss the ball to someone else and ask a new question. Ready? She tossed the ball to a girl three people from Beck who fumbled the yarn ball. 
If you had a time machine, what point in the future or history would you visit? Um. I'd love to live during the Civil War. American history is my favorite time period. Very good. Mrs. Porter's head bobbed her approval, eyes wrinkling at the corners. Now toss the ball of yarn to the next person. The girl tossed the ball across the room back towards Mrs. Porter. Kara caught it. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Australia because the boys have sexy accents. Kara wrinkled her freckled nose and giggled. The other girls and Brent giggled with her. Beck frowned. Kara tossed the yarn to Brent who would save his computer, his family photos, and his cell phone if he were in a burning building. The game continued, forming a very complicated web of string between all the people. The yarn came sailing Beck's direction and he panicked, ducking and holding his hands up to catch the ball. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? Manda M. stared at Beck, challenging him to be honest. I, Beck's eyelids fluttered, and he picked at the yarn ball. He took in a deep breath and sighed out his nerves. The hardest thing I've ever done was go to therapy. Mrs. Porter beamed. That's impressive honesty, Beck. Trembling, Beck tossed the ball to someone not pinching a corner of string. D does your name have a special meaning or were you named after someone special? The boy, Buddy, puffed up his chest as he explained his name. All the first boys in his family were named Buddy. It was a family name. Buddy tossed the ball back to Mrs. Porter. Very good everyone. She clapped, you guys roll the ball of yarn back up for me and I will tell you about the next game. Beck dropped his pinched string, letting the extroverted students roll the ball of yarn up. He jammed his hands in his pocket, keeping his elbows at his sides and trying to make himself as small as possible. Mrs. Porter pulled flashcards from her purse of games. For the second game, they sat down, and she placed the stack of cards in the middle of the circle. They went counterclockwise, pulling a card, reading the question aloud and then answering it as a short answer. Each person answered twice. Carol would spend $10,000 on ending animal cruelty and unethical treatment. Her dream job in 10 years is to be the head of an animal rescue organization, rescuing dogs, cats, and all other animals. Buddy wanted to buy a huge pickup truck if he could buy a car right now. He loved hunting and he needed a good off-road vehicle. He wanted to change the size of his feet because they were too big and it was difficult to find shoes. Each answer brought Beck closer to his turn. His nervousness grew, he strummed his fingers on the floor, nails tapping the ground to no rhythm. Manda M answered her two questions. Then Coco, and all eyes were on Beck again. He leaned forward, sweaty fingers grabbing a laminated card. If you sat down next to Jesus on a bus, what would you talk about? He didn't recognize his voice. I would talk about the nature of human cruelty. Because? Because people worry about the safety of animals when children starve and sleep outside every night. Silence enveloped the group of young people. Beck tucked his card under the deck and grabbed another. If if you could be someone else, who would you be? He blinked, staring forward. Seconds passed and then minutes. I'm sorry, I'm thinking. Ah. He flailed. Mrs. Porter's smile tightened as Beck's thinking wore on, shifting from natural to forced. A movie star. I would be a movie star. He blew out his breath, because I could help others and I could express my point of views in a large platform. He tucked the second card away. He didn't hear any answers past his own, just the lull of different voices. Mrs. Porter congratulated them again on a good round and peeked at the clock. Her face fell. A.W. We only have five minutes left of class, so I suppose you guys are safe from my last game. Next time, we'll play it and we will talk about what you will be doing in this course. She called as the students collected their bags and purses. Beck wandered to his desk, throwing his bag over his shoulder with a frown. Mrs. Porter's class was group therapy Beck didn't ask for and didn't enjoy. The naive worries of his peers frustrated him. He chewed his bottom lip as he pulled his folded schedule from his pocket, mapping his last location. He walked all the way across campus to get to the three-story art building, taking the stairs to the third floor. 
He studied the art hanging on the walls until he reached an already bustling classroom. Unlike the traditional lecture rooms, the art room's collection of mismatched chairs littered a concrete floor. Wooden drawing horses leaned against the wall. An older gentleman stood in front of the chairs, and students were already sitting, bags at their feet. Beck slinked in, sitting in the closet chair and tucking his bag between his feet. He fished his history book from his bag and hunched over it, getting an early start on the history homework to avoid conversation. Fifteen minutes passed before the gentleman spoke. Welcome to Art 101, I'm Martin Jackson. You can call me Marty, Martin, Jackson, whatever. If you came to this class to learn how to draw, then you're in the wrong place. I can't teach you how to draw, but I can teach you techniques to improve. We'll go over some different styles, and you will have one project due per week based on the technique we're learning. I will give you the option to resubmit projects as long as they were turned in completed on their due date. If you turn it in late, you don't get a redo. Beck exchanged his history book for the three-page art class syllabus. As far as supplies. Let's go over them. For in-class practice, newsprint is your best friend. You can get a pad cheap at the art store down the street. All your final projects must be submitted on drawing paper. You need to purchase a pack of soft charcoal sticks, hard charcoal sticks, an eight-pack of graphite pencils, one kneaded eraser, one white eraser, and blending stumps. You need a drawing clipboard with extra clamps and a plastic large-size portfolio for transporting your work. Any questions? How much is all this gonna cost? A boy in a cowboy hat piped up, arms folded across his chest and slouched in his seat. If you're smart, not much more than 30 bucks. Report back to me how much you spend. Martin grinned, his pool blue eyes glittering against his weather-worn skin. Beck giggled, folding his syllabus and looking at the professor. Right on. He tipped his hat down, a grin of his own matching the instructor's. When are we expected to have all of the supplies? The girl beside Beck rose her hand and spoke at the same time. Thursday's class, but good news. Class today is over so you all can purchase supplies. If you're tight on money, you won't need the drawing pad or the graphite pencils right away. On Thursday you must have your newsprint, clipboard, your charcoal drawing tools, and your erasers. Anything else? How many times can we redo a drawing? Asking for a friend. The boy in the cowboy hat spoke again. Your friend will have as many chances as they need. You only get two. If nothing else, then I'll leave you all to it. If you need me, I will be in my office down the hall. Martin nodded and strolled to the exit, leaving the students to themselves. Speaking erupted from Beck's peers, friends twisting in their seats to talk to one another. They discussed Martin's charming salt and pepper hair, his boyish smile, his easygoing nature. By definition, he was a chill professor. Beck peeked at his phone, smiling at a message from Tobias, before standing and tucking it away. He threw his bag over his shoulder and walked to the door. Oh. Hey. Wait up. A girl hurried after Beck. Beck kept walking. She touched his shoulder and he spun around. W what? Beck scowled. You forgot this? She handed his folded syllabus to him. Oh, thanks. I guess it fell out of my bag. Thanks. He blushed. So. I'm Morgan, but my friends call me Mo. She smiled and quirked her shoulders up. Her pixie haircut bounced with her movements. I'm Beck. My friends call me Beck. He adjusted his bag on his shoulder. Hi, Beck. Want to shop for supplies with me? Ah. Uh, yeah, okay. Sure. A little smile touched his lips. A broader one touched hers, she showed all of her pearly white teeth and linked arms with him. She led him out of the art building and accompanied him down the several blocks to the art store. So, Beck. Tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? Well, anything. Are you from around here? What high school did you go to? What's your favorite food? Um. Yes, well, no. I'm not from around here. I didn't go to high school, 
and burgers. Oh, you were homeschooled? No wonder you're so quiet. Now it makes sense. She opened the door for them, keeping one arm linked to Bex. The art store overflowed with supplies. Every nook and crevice contained a box or bin or stack of warm-smelling supplies. The smell of paint filtered through Beck's nose and he sighed. Smells good, huh? You're a real artist. H.M.? I don't think so. Beck blushed. You are because you relaxed when we got here. You've been tense the whole walk but when we got in here, you completely relaxed. You're home, you're an artist. Don't disagree with me again. She scolded him. What kind of art do you do? H.M.? I paint a little. Abstract acrylic on canvas. Beck shrugged, his nose taking him to the paints. He passed the drawing pads and the charcoal and brushed his thumb over natural hair bristle brushes. Oh, good. I was worried you'd be into photorealism or something. Everyone thinks photorealism is so interesting, but if you wanted photorealism, take a picture. It's cheaper and you can print as many as you want. Mo rolled her eyes. I guess so. What do you? A little of everything. Right now, I'm experimenting with printmaking and photography. I have a love for painting, though, but I wanted to explore other styles of art. What's printmaking? H.M.? She picked at palette brushes and tubes of paint, opening them to test the vibrancy of various colors. Printmaking is how it sounds. The process of making prints. Before we had computers to make copies, we had to design block prints and use ink to transfer prints. Oh, look here. Mo dragged him to a collection of art pieces for sale. See the numbers here? The first number means the order of the print and the second is the amount made. Oh. It says 10 out of 50. Is 10 a good number? Well, usually the first couple prints are really blotchy because too much ink and then the end prints are starting to run out of ink, so it's best to get the middle prints if it's traditional printmaking, of course. HM makes sense. What kind of tools do you use for printmaking? You can use almost anything. Right now, I'm experimenting with non-traditional tools such as leaves or sponges or erasers. I did a few prints using the woodblock carving method. I could show you some time. Yeah? I guess I've never thought about trying other art stuff. Beck mused, biting the inside of his cheek. I want to try printmaking. We could, we could hang out? Maybe? Hey, sure. I'm a member of this artist group I meet with on Wednesdays, too. This week we're meeting Wednesday morning at 4 to set up for Golden Hour Photos. What's Golden Hour Photos? Mo giggled. It's not Golden Hour Photos. We're going to take photos during the Golden Hour. It's the hour as the sun rises, and it has the best natural light for photography. You should come. I mean, I know it's tomorrow but grab a disposable camera and meet us up there. I can pick you up. I, I don't know. I have homework for my classes tomorrow and, I, it's complicated. Beck frowned. It sounds fun. Maybe next time you guys do it? Yeah, I get you. You and I can do something fun Wednesday. Some prints, maybe? They're real easy. Sure. Relieved, Beck smiled at Mo. They finally reached the aisles of dry art supplies and Mo picked and poked at everything. All you need for sun prints is the specific sun print paper, something to make the prints with, and water. Leaves and branches always make cool prints. Oh, cool. Is the paper here? I guess we can buy it tomorrow. Beck picked the pencils he remembered from the syllabus, getting the pack of graphite and a large pack of charcoal supplies. The charcoal supplies included one eraser and after he grabbed one more, he continued to the paper pads. Yeah, we'll get it tomorrow. What's your schedule tomorrow? I have class in the morning and one in the afternoon. Oh, awesome. Me, too. We can meet at the union and then go get the paper and make the prints, yeah. Beck smiled, green eyes dancing as he nodded to his friend. They finished purchasing supplies, both having identical totals slightly under $30.
They carted their supplies to the parking lot where Mo deposited hers in her beat-up little sedan and then asked Beck if he needed a ride. With his driver on the way, he needed company more than a ride. Mo's eyes bulged at Beck's confession and even more when Tobias Black Limousine peeled into the college parking lot. Embarrassed, Beck shoved his bag and supplies towards the driver and gave Mo a quick goodbye. He pushed Tobias back into the limousine when he opened the door to get in. Wednesday Beck and Mo made sun prints while Mo teased Beck about his limousine and fancy driver. Beck confessed some truths of his life, about Tobias and their big house. Mo's questions about his childhood were answered with carefully crafted lies. Beck researched normal childhoods and created one for himself. He was born three cities over to a single mother with three kids. He was the middle child, he told Mo. He met Tobias at a party and moved to the city at Tobias' suggestion to start a new life. They've been dating for over half a year. Mo swooned, eyelids fluttering. She asked question after question about Tobias and Beck, hinting at naughtier things which made them both blush and Beck to change the subject. After Beck's confessions, Mo talked about herself, answering the questions she asked Beck without prompting. He laughed and giggled and smiled appropriately, finding the process of printmaking more interesting than Mo's personal life, but she never knew it. Thursday, they sat next to each other in art class, working through the first assignment as partners, and soon they were spending most evenings working on one art project or another. Beck kept up with his other classes, completing reading tasks and quizzes before hanging out with Mo and spending late hours in the campus dark room or waking up early to take pictures in the soft daylight hours. By mid-semester, both Beck and Mo had solid as in art class and had made t-shirts, a variety of prints, and were working on making their own stencils. Beck hovered at A.B. in all his other classes, devoting his brain energy to his developing social life. He was a hit at the art group, having natural talent the other attendees dreamed of. He brought some of his abstract pieces to show and received praises from on high. Mo spent the night on several occasions, and they spent late nights giggling in his bedroom when Tobias peeked in to make sure they were okay. Beck sent Tobias up and down for drinks, then food, then drinks again, keeping Mo in an incessant giggling fit. The last day of classes before mid-semester break, Beck and Mo relaxed by the campus water fountain, hands behind their head and sun warming bare legs. What are you doing for your break? Um. Well, Toby and I were thinking of a vacation since we haven't seen much of each other lately. My therapist said a vacation would be good for us. Your therapist? You, why? Why do you go to the rapist? Because I needed to talk to someone? I guess. You seem fine to me. Therapists are stupid. All they do is ask, what do you think about how you feel right now and charge you a hundred bucks a session? Oh. Well, I don't pay for it. Toby pays for it. Girl. Stop. Toby pays for you to go to therapy? Does he think you're crazy? No, he, you shouldn't let a man pay for you like that. Dump the therapist and if he says anything about it, I'd consider dumping him, too. I, well. I don't mind the therapy, though. Sure but, come on, do you really need it? You're not like having problems getting out of bed or seeing dead people. So why are you wasting your time? You could spend your therapy time working on art instead which would be a much better use of your time, anyway. Yeah, you know what, you're right. We don't even really talk about anything. She drags emotions out of me all the time like crying is supposed to help. Beck covered his eyes with his arm, shielding them from the sun. Ah. Lame. The hundred bucks you spend on therapy could be used to buy so many art supplies. Could you imagine? All the canvas and what we could buy with a hundred extra dollars a week. Yeah, hum. Should I go on the vacation with him? He's letting me pick the place. At first, I was thinking Europe or something, but I don't know. Part of me wants to stay here and have time away from having to always do boring school work. Oh, up to you, honey. Millimeter but you and I should do something fun one of the weekends. What about if we rented a hotel room for a weekend and did art for a full 72 hours? Mo rolled onto her side facing Beck. Huh? 
an experiment on how our perception and our art changes over the course of three days of continuous creation. And of sleep deprivation, too. 72 hours. No sleep, only art. What do you think? Sounds like a terrible idea. Beck chuckled, squinting up at his friend. So, you're in? Yeah, okay. I'm down. Let's do it next weekend so we can buy supplies over the week. He closed his eyes again. We should do an abstract series. I'm all in, baby. Mo smirked and laid back down next to him. Beck's semester break was full of sunbathing and swimming in the private backyard pool with Tobias nearby in not much more than fitted briefs. Tobias swam laps in the pool most mornings as Beck caught up on casual reading, sunglasses perched on his head and slender legs crossed at the ankle. Their middays were spent taking a siesta inside, and the evenings were shopping, discovering a new local restaurant and enjoying each other's private company, something they missed with Beck in school and Tobias working with his two trainees. Thursday, they made dinner together after purchasing all the supplies necessary for Beck's weekend with Mo. Friday, Tobias was determined to enjoy the last few hours before Beck was gone for an entire weekend and sleeping somewhere else, too. Tobias woke Beck with the smell of an elaborate breakfast traveling through the vents and rousing him from sleep belly first. Beck's legs carried him from his room down the carpeted staircase and into the kitchen, resting his elbows on the counter, still yawning. MMM, smells good. Beck murmured. For you. So, you can have one good meal before your wild weekend of art and convenience food. Tobias kissed Beck's cheek and placed a full plate in front of him. Ah. Thank you. I'm excited. Beck beamed up at Tobias, turning to kiss him on the mouth and shrug his shoulders up around his ears. But I had fun with you this week. I've missed you. I missed you, too. Tobias kissed Beck's neck, lips sweeping his bare shoulders. Beck shivered. Tobias brushed his fingers along Beck's sharp jawline, thumb touching his full bottom lip. He went after one last kiss, lips pursed together as he pressed them into Beck's. He lingered there, petting Beck's curls and stroking his soft skin before he reluctantly pulled away with a soft rumble. I can see. Beck giggled, enjoying his breakfast and his company before he returned upstairs to shower and pack a weekend bag. By noon, they were loaded in the car with Tobias on edge and Beck relaxed next to him. Beck squeezed his shoulder and offered a quick kiss to his jawline. This is the first time you've stayed away from home, you know. I know. And it's going to be okay. You're being overprotective. No, I mean you can go. Of course, you can do whatever you want, I'm just. I'm nervous. I'm used to seeing you every morning and I won't for two days. I forgot how it felt to wake up alone. It seemed natural you know, when you moved in. I know. It felt the same for me. It's okay. I'll be back Sunday primed for cuddles and probably exhausted. Did I tell you what we're doing? Sorta? We're doing an experiment on how art changes based on your level of rest. So, we're going to try to stay up for 72 hours and paint around the clock. I want to try to get two paintings a day done. So, two today, two Saturday, and two Sunday and I want to compare them. Huh? It sounds cool. Did you all have to pick the seediest hotel to go to? Yes, it creates ambience, Mo said. Don't worry, we'll be safe. It's rough looking, but it's not the worst. Not really comforting, but if you guys want this one, it's okay. You know my phone is always on for you. Tobias peeled into the parking lot of an old hotel building with outdoor entrances. The style was familiar to Tobias and he frowned, but then forced a smile for Beck. You worry too much. I'm going to be okay. I promise. With a kiss, Beck unlatched his seatbelt. Help me carry all the supplies up to the room. She says it's room 211. Beck carried his small supplies, the tackle box of paint, a new pack of sturdy blue towels, and his weekend bag. Tobias grabbed as many canvases as he could in one go, lifting them high above his knees to make walking easier. It took Tobias three trips to cart up all of Beck's huge canvases and another trip for his smaller packs necessary for small-sized studies and color practice. Beck. 
Mo grinned and clutched him around the neck when she saw him. She stepped aside, still clinging to the shorter man, as Tobias carried things inside. Are you ready for a full weekend of all art all the time, baby? Oh, hello. Hi. Mo watched Tobias bend over and set the canvases down. I got all of them for you. Tobias pulled his sagging pants up on his hips and ducked his head, broad shoulders lopsided in his embarrassment. He avoided the girl's eye, focusing only on Beck's smirking face. Perfect. Okay. I promise I'll call you if we need anything. Beck snaked away from his friend, giving Tobias a quick peck on the cheek and squeezing his rough hands. Okay. I'll see you Sunday. Make some cool stuff. He returned the kiss. Waving at Mo, he bid them both a good weekend and left. With Tobias gone, a surge of nervousness washed over Beck, but he took a deep breath, held it, and then released it as he turned to face Mo. Oh my god. He exhaled, rocking back on his heels. This is going to be so much fun. God, right? Let's get set up. Mo pulled two travel easels from the collection of art supplies, handing one to Beck. He shifted the bed to the side to give them more space to paint and set his easel in the corner of the room, allowing space to move around as he worked. He shifted the bedside table as a place to rest his supplies and moved the other table over to Mo for her supplies. As Mo set up music, he poured globs of paint on his glass palette and mixed thick pastel colors. He filled his recycled plastic container with water and he dipped his brushes. Starting from the largest and working down to the smallest, he layered paint on his canvas, pulling vibrant colors from the depths of the canvas as he built layer after layer. Mo's technique consisted of slapping paint on the white canvas and then pouring water to help the paint spread around to give her direction. She expanded on the colors developed from the natural water mixing with the paint already on the canvas and developed a haphazard abstract painting. Beck set his painting aside to dry as he started his next using the same palette of colors. The paintings looked similar but different, being sisters and not twins. He switched back and forth until he was satisfied with both paintings and out of the selection of colors he'd originally mixed. He moved on to another palette to continue. The second round of paintings featured rich jewel tones instead of pastels. Beck bobbed to the music and let his emotions flow shutting off his active brain to think with his heart. After he finished three more paintings and they were well into the wee hours of Saturday morning, he rinsed his palette again and looked to Mo. She was on her fourth grandiose painting and had accumulated more paint on places other than the canvas than what she'd put on her art surface. Beck chuckled. I think I need a break. Getting a little sleepy. How are you feeling? Me? I'm good. I had a little coffee while you were working on painting three and four and a little pick-me-up. I could go all night, or, well, all day now. She smiled, eyelids fluttering. Oh? You should have grabbed me coffee, but I don't know if even an espresso will keep me up right now. I'm going to take a short nap. No, honey. You can't. Remember? The experiment involves no sleep. Well I figured we'd nap, at least. No one can stay up for three days. Technically, you could stay up for eleven days. Beck's semester break was full of sunbathing and swimming in the private backyard pool with Tobias nearby in not much more than fitted briefs. Tobias swam laps in the pool most mornings as Beck caught up on casual reading, sunglasses perched on his head and slender legs crossed at the ankle. Their middays were spent taking a siesta inside, and the evenings were shopping, discovering a new local restaurant and enjoying each other's private company, something they missed with Beck in school and Tobias working with his two trainees. Thursday, they made dinner together after purchasing all the supplies necessary for Beck's weekend with Mo. Friday, Tobias was determined to enjoy the last few hours before Beck was gone for an entire weekend and sleeping somewhere else, too. Tobias woke Beck with the smell of an elaborate breakfast traveling through the vents and rousing him from sleep belly first. Beck's legs carried him from his room down the carpeted staircase and into the kitchen, resting his elbows on the counter, still yawning. MMM, smells good. Beck murmured. For you. So, you can have one good meal before your wild weekend of art and convenience food. Tobias kissed Beck's cheek and placed a full plate in front of him. 
Ah. Thank you. I'm excited. Beck beamed up at Tobias, turning to kiss him on the mouth and shrug his shoulders up around his ears. But I had fun with you this week. I've missed you. I missed you, too. Tobias kissed Beck's neck, lips sweeping his bare shoulders. Beck shivered. Tobias brushed his fingers along Beck's sharp jawline, thumb touching his full bottom lip. He went after one last kiss, lips pursed together as he pressed them into Beck's. He lingered there, petting Beck's curls and stroking his soft skin before he reluctantly pulled away with a soft rumble. I can see. Beck giggled, enjoying his breakfast and his company before he returned upstairs to shower and pack a weekend bag. By noon, they were loaded in the car with Tobias on edge and Beck relaxed next to him. Beck squeezed his shoulder and offered a quick kiss to his jawline. This is the first time you've stayed away from home, you know. I know. And it's going to be okay. You're being overprotective. No, I mean you can go. Of course, you can do whatever you want, I'm just. I'm nervous. I'm used to seeing you every morning and I won't for two days. I forgot how it felt to wake up alone. It seemed natural you know, when you moved in. I know. It felt the same for me. It's okay. I'll be back Sunday primed for cuddles and probably exhausted. Did I tell you what we're doing? Sorta? We're doing an experiment on how art changes based on your level of rest. So, we're going to try to stay up for 72 hours and paint around the clock. I want to try to get two paintings a day done. So, two today, two Saturday, and two Sunday and I want to compare them. Huh? It sounds cool. Did you all have to pick the seediest hotel to go to? Yes, it creates ambience, Mo said. Don't worry, we'll be safe. It's rough looking, but it's not the worst. Not really comforting, but if you guys want this one, it's okay. You know my phone is always on for you. Tobias peeled into the parking lot of an old hotel building with outdoor entrances. The style was familiar to Tobias and he frowned, but then forced a smile for Beck. You worry too much. I'm going to be okay. I promise. With a kiss, Beck unlatched his seatbelt. Help me carry all the supplies up to the room. She says it's room 211. Beck carried his small supplies, the tackle box of paint, a new pack of sturdy blue towels, and his weekend bag. Tobias grabbed as many canvases as he could in one go, lifting them high above his knees to make walking easier. It took Tobias three trips to cart up all of Beck's huge canvases and another trip for his smaller packs necessary for small-sized studies and color practice. Beck. Mo grinned and clutched him around the neck when she saw him. She stepped aside, still clinging to the shorter man, as Tobias carried things inside. Are you ready for a full weekend of all art all the time, baby? Oh, hello. Hi. Mo watched Tobias bend over and set the canvases down. I got all of them for you. Tobias pulled his sagging pants up on his hips and ducked his head, broad shoulders lopsided in his embarrassment. He avoided the girl's eye, focusing only on Beck's smirking face. Perfect. Okay. I promise I'll call you if we need anything. Beck snaked away from his friend, giving Tobias a quick peck on the cheek and squeezing his rough hands. Okay. I'll see you Sunday. Make some cool stuff. He returned the kiss. Waving at Mo, he bid them both a good weekend and left. With Tobias gone, a surge of nervousness washed over Beck, but he took a deep breath, held it, and then released it as he turned to face Mo. Oh my god. He exhaled, rocking back on his heels. This is going to be so much fun. God, right? Let's get set up. Mo pulled two travel easels from the collection of art supplies, handing one to Beck. He shifted the bed to the side to give them more space to paint and set his easel in the corner of the room, allowing space to move around as he worked. He shifted the bedside table as a place to rest his supplies and moved the other table over to Mo for her supplies. As Mo set up music, he poured globs of paint on his glass palette and mixed thick pastel colors. He filled his recycled plastic container with water and he dipped his brushes. Starting from the largest and working down to the smallest, 
he layered paint on his canvas, pulling vibrant colors from the depths of the canvas as he built layer after layer. Moe's technique consisted of slapping paint on the white canvas and then pouring water to help the paint spread around to give her direction. She expanded on the colors developed from the natural water mixing with the paint already on the canvas and developed a haphazard abstract painting. Beck set his painting aside to dry as he started his next using the same palette of colors. The paintings looked similar but different, being sisters and not twins. He switched back and forth until he was satisfied with both paintings and out of the selection of colors he'd originally mixed. He moved on to another palette to continue. The second round of paintings featured rich jewel tones instead of pastels. Beck bobbed to the music and let his emotions flow, shutting off his active brain to think with his heart. After he finished three more paintings and they were well into the wee hours of Saturday morning, he rinsed his palette again and looked to Mo. She was on her fourth grandiose painting and had accumulated more paint on places other than the canvas than what she'd put on her art surface. Beck chuckled. I think I need a break. Getting a little sleepy. How are you feeling? Me? I'm good. I had a little coffee while you were working on painting three and four and a little pick me up. I could go all night, or, well, all day now. She smiled, eyelids fluttering. Oh? You should have grabbed me coffee, but I don't know if even an espresso will keep me up right now. I'm going to take a short nap. No, honey. You can't. Remember? The experiment involves no sleep. Um. Well I figured we'd nap, at least. No one can stay up for three days. Technically, you could stay up for eleven days. Bullshit. No, it's true. This guy set the world record for most hours awake and it was over two hundred hours. I think you can handle seventy-two. But if you really don't think you can, I can give you something to help. Mo snapped her finger and dug in her pocket, pulling out lint and multicolored tablets. She handed one to Beck. What's this? Molly. Or X, or MDMA, also known as a damn good time. Um. I don't do drugs. It's not a drug, it used to be legal. They used to give it to the military to help them stay awake. Mo giggled. Take it. Oh, take half, if you're really concerned. If you don't like it, I promise I won't suggest taking it again. Cross my heart. Right. Beck frowned, looking at the pill with a butterfly stamped on it. He twisted it in his fingers, digging his nail into the middle to snap it in half. Whatever. He glanced at Mo again before popping it past his lips and swallowing it. He poked his tongue out as the bitter insides passed over his tongue. Ick. Okay. I'm going to go get something to drink. Be right back and I'll be ready for more painting. Sure thing. She waved him off. Beck purchased two drinks from the vending machine and returned as the high kicked in. Re-energized, he cleaned his palette and went back to painting. Time fell away as he kept working, his paintings going from dark and captivating to bright, flirty colors. He finished a series of four small pieces in record time as the effects of the little pill wore off. The side effects were mild, he slipped from a giddiness back to calm and tired. He pushed through for a few hours, dragging his paintbrushes lazily over the canvas until he took the other half and his speed picked up again. Sunday came soon and late. When Mo called time on their project, Beck collapsed into the hotel bed. He sobbed. Oh. I could sleep for days. Oh my god. He groaned, curling into a fetal position. Right? I'm going to feel so terrible tomorrow. Mo flopped into the bed next to him. Okay, now, we take all of our pieces home, but we don't look at them for at least a week. Then, we'll critique them. Just. After a nap. Yes. After a nap. The tail end of his words slurred as he fell asleep. He slept for five solid hours and woke only because of the rhythmic knocking to their hotel room. Stop. I'm coming. I'm coming. He grumbled, trudging to his feet and to the door. Beck. I was getting worried, sorry. Tobias' kind voice throbbed in his brain. 
he leaned into him, burying his face in Tobias' chest. Where's Mo? Huh? G gone, I guess. Maybe someone picked her up. This place is a mess. Is fine. Beck muttered, canvases. In car. Supplies. In car. Beck. In car. He nodded to his plan and rubbed his eyes enough to find Tobias's car. He wandered down the stairs and into the passenger seat as Tobias packed his canvases and supplies. Part 3 Tobias appreciated Beck's new best friend but didn't appreciate some of the crazy schemes she came up with. After the weekend of painting, she dragged Beck out most Saturday mornings for photography with an expensive camera and equipment Beck purchased after prompting. She convinced him to purchase expensive printmaking supplies they used together for a round of t-shirts she tried to sell. Beck, thankfully, declined her suggestion to turn the garage into a woodshop to build their own canvases, but most evenings Tobias was home alone as Beck engaged in one thing or another. Beck came home smiling and relaying the details of his latest adventure to Tobias most nights, soothing his growing worries. Tobias' schedule changed, too. He took a job reviewing the stunts for an independent film on top of training Smash and Tiger. He shifted their training time to later in the evening and spent his days on set. Sometimes Beck met him on the movie set, sometimes he didn't. The film was almost finished, planning to wrap up filming before the community college's finals. Hey Coleman. Good work on the stunt choreography. Looks good. The skinny director gave Tobias a thumbs up. No problem. Tobias nodded. Yep. The director pressed his headset into his ear, muttering something to the assistant director on the other end and waved Tobias back to work. Tobias rolled his eyes, jogging to the refreshments table to grab a glass of water. His phone buzzed in his pocket. Tobias glanced at the name before putting the phone to his ear. Hey Deborah, what's going on? Hey Toby. I'm sorry to be calling you like this, but have you heard from Beck? He hasn't been to a session in a few weeks now and he won't return my calls. Huh? I mean yeah, I hear from him. He lives with me? Well, has he said anything about ending therapy? Maybe he told you and I'm forgetting. I am human, after all. She forced a chuckle. He hasn't talked to me about anything. I'll have him call you, how's that? Perfect. Thanks, Toby. No problem. Thanks for calling. Tobias ended the call with a growl. He slipped his phone back in his pocket and swallowed the glass of water, squeezing the cup he shook his head, willing himself to calm down and get back to work. Finishing the fighting critiques distracted him until he saw Beck and Mo loping on set together, arms linked. He heard Mo's shrill laughter first, and Beck's soft voice touched his ears next. He excused himself from the actors and approached the pair. Toby. Mo quirked an eyebrow and the corner of her lips. Hey, baby. Beck moved from Mo to Tobias, hugging and kissing him. Missed you. Hey. Yeah. Um. I need to talk to you about something. Okay. Beck shrugged, sliding his hands down Tobias' shoulders and lacing their fingers. Tobias looked at Mo and then back at Beck. Well. You stopped going to Deborah? Yeah. I didn't feel like going anymore. The corner of his lips tugged into a half smile, challenging Tobias. Oh. Well, you didn't call her and let her know? And you didn't tell me you were stopping, because I have to tell you everything, right? Beck narrowed his eyes. Well, I stopped because I realized something, I didn't want to go to therapy. You wanted me to go because you thought I had problems. I don't, I don't think you have problems. I just, right. So, then why did you make me talk to someone twice a week? Why'd you take me and drop me off for four full months? Because you can't drive? Look, Beck, I thought, yeah, you thought wrong. I don't need therapy, and I don't need you telling me what to do. I can take care of myself. I have for my whole damn life and it's not changing now. Beck pushed Tobias away from him, putting space between their bodies and tilting his head as he scowled up at Tobias. Beck. I would like it if you at least called her to say you're not going to go anymore. Why? 
Why don't you call her back and tell her what you decided for me since she called you, anyway? His eyelids fluttered, and he scoffed, shaking his head. So messed up. Right. Mo agreed, resting an arm across Beck's shoulders and glaring at Tobias. Defeated, Tobias' meaty shoulders sagged. It's fine. Ah. I had a thing with Charles tonight, are you still coming? He misses you, too? Charles is your friend, not mine. Beck tilted his head one way and then the other, touching his head to Mo's cheek. In other words, no. Well. Fine. Do whatever, then. I'll see you back at home later. Yeah, maybe you will. I'll call you. Beck pursed his lips. Mo smiled, pecking Beck's cheek. Bye, now. Devilish green eyes met Tobias. He strolled from the set connected to Mo. Tobias watched them both get smaller until they turned a corner and were gone. He clenched a fist until his muscles ticked and he stretched his fingers. He finished up with the set, going straight to the exclusive bar across town to meet his best friend. Charles sat in the back corner, beside a stretched window. A lion in a suit, Charles surveyed his pride, brooding eyes clocking everyone in the room. When Tobias entered, Charles flashed a smile. My man. He pulled Tobias into a hug, slapping his back warmly. I already ordered your favorite. Cheap beer. Charles' rolling laugh eased Tobias' worries and he sat down across from his friend. Hey. Sorry I'm late. It's fine. I had plenty of time to, he paused, meeting the eyes of a slender gazelle. Think. She approached, dropping another scotch in front of Charles. Thank you. She slipped away again. Yeah. I had a fight with Beck and his stupid new friend. The girl? Yeah, Mo. Tobias drawled. Am I controlling? Controlling? Charles laughed, you are the least controlling. You gave a boy you're not fucking your limousine, offered him the biggest bedroom in your house, and are putting him through school and therapy. He doesn't go to therapy anymore. His loss, he needs to be. He's an onion. An onion? Yeah. Each time you cut into him, everyone cries. Anyway, point is. You're not controlling, why? Charles sipped his scotch. Beck accused me of forcing him to go to therapy because he started going when he moved in. I mean, I never thought it was a question for him to talk to someone. Ah. Well, he was never a teenager, so I suppose this is the perfect time to rebel with someone who's not controlling your life. Maybe he thinks he can do and say what he wants because he's comfortable. Or maybe his dumbass friend is feeding him lies. Maybe. I barely see him anymore. He's with Mo or he's sleeping off one of their weird marathon art sessions. I don't know. Do you think I should be worried? Tobias picked the label of his beer. Um. Well, yes and no. He's an artist, they get into things. I would worry about the friend though. She didn't want to sleep with me. She might be a robot. Charles, not everyone wants to sleep with you. Chuckling, he put the beer to his lips for a taste. No, but they do. Charles corrected, a sly grin on his face. Right. Well, I don't like the influence Mo's bringing, but I don't want to say anything. I want him to be his own person. Admirable of you. And if he comes back to you, he's yours? Sounds like the premise of a terrible romantic comedy. Sure. What's been going on with you? Ah, uh, not much. Broke ground on a new property we're building. It's a high-rise apartment building. More real estate, of course. It's expected to be complete by the end of next year. Charles explained, slipping into a serious expression as their talk delved into business futures. Charles lamented about tax breaks for the wealthy, considered donating more to organizations rather than giving the money straight to the government. Tobias updated him on the independent film and Smash and Tiger's progress as fighters and they made plans to watch the next big match. Tobias called Beck three times during the course of his night with Charles to no answer. Do you have Mo's number? I don't. You know I don't. 
she wouldn't give me her number if it killed her. And you texted him, too? Yeah. It's not like him not to answer at all. He'll stay out, but usually he'll call at least. I guess his painting. I'll try him again later. Tobias stared at his phone, begging it to light up with Beck's returning call. Anxiety formed in the pit of his stomach, pebbles building on each other until they made his walk to the exit heavy, his words few. Look. If you're worried. He's going to be pissed, but check his location and check up on him. But only if you're really worried. Charles slipped his hands into the pockets of his flat front trousers, pulling a foreign cigarette and a lighter from his pockets. Yeah I know. I hate to do it, but he hasn't been himself lately. I mean I know he's only been here for a year, but, I know what you mean. It's not just him out of his shell. Do you think he's doing drugs? I don't know. The only drugs I know are performance ones. I don't know the symptoms of other drug use. Well, what weird things does he do? Sometimes when he calls he's really chatty. He talks non-stop, but not like when he gets excited. It's more obsessive. He'll describe little things or once he said he felt superhuman, like he had superpowers. Sounds like drugs. I thought it was an art thing or something. Tobias frowned. Sounds like drugs, dude. What else? Well, like I said he sleeps when he's home, doesn't matter what time of day. He's been grumbly, but I figured it was from school. Today, he pushed me. Right after we'd been holding hands and he said he missed me. I'm going to call him again. Go ahead. Charles took a long drag as Tobias' shaky hands lifted his phone to his ear. He paced as the phone rang and rang and went to a cheery voicemail telling the person to leave a message and he'll get back to them later. Tobias looked at Charles, crestfallen. Nothing. Let's go check the house first. If he's not home, then we'll go look for him. Better safe than sorry, always. Yeah. Come on, we'll take my driver. I'll come by and grab your car later since you always insist on driving like a commoner. Charles guided Tobias to his limousine and inside. They rode in silence, Tobias drumming his fingers and tapping his foot, his intuitive senses tingling. Charles finished his cigarette and lit another, feigning calm for Tobias. Charles sat in the car as Tobias went inside. Tobias checked and rechecked every room. He started in the kitchen, checking the main floor. He checked his office, Beck's studio, all the bedrooms, including his own. He peeked in every bathroom, opening the curtains hiding the shower and the hidden storage spaces. He checked the game room and the secret media room. Then he did it all again before checking the backyard. Rubbing his face, he went back to Charles' limousine, climbing inside. Nothing. Check his location on his phone. Charles instructed with another slow drag. Tobias nodded, fumbling with his phone to click Beck's name and go to information on the device. His, he's at the hotel. The one him and Mo go to when they paint. It's off the highway in a busy part of downtown. Charles tipped his head to the driver. Take us there. He instructed. The driver peeled from Tobias' driveway. Damn it. Tobias muttered, putting his phone to his lips and staring out the window. He forced his breath even, taking one deep breath after another. His heart pounded in his chest. It's okay. We're going to find him, and he'll be in a painting. You know how he gets. Charles' voice shifted mechanical, saying words he didn't believe. Why yeah? Tears welled into Bias' eyes, tan cheeks blotchy as he tried to hold his emotions in. He lost the battle, wiping tears from the corners of his eyes and pinching the bridge of his nose. Charles did the only thing a good friend could do, pretend nothing was happening. Tobias jumped out of Charles' black limousine when it rolled to a stop in front of the hotel lobby. He walked around the decorative plant in the middle of the room and approached the small check-in counter. The single worker smiled to him, looking up from painting her nails bubblegum pink. Her stringy brown hair framed her round face. How can I help YA? Her eyes trailed over Tobias, avoiding his face in favor of roving over his broad chest and down to his slim waist. Her eyes lingered on his crotch. Ah, uh, 
Well. I'm looking for someone. He rolled his shoulders forward, fighting to make his large body look smaller and more apologetic. I'm looking for this guy Beck and this girl Mo. Sir. I'm not supposed to tell you the names of my hotel guests. I, I understand, but it might be an emergency. Beck Beck's my boyfriend. And I've been calling him, and he hasn't answered which really isn't like him. Tobias' voice trembled. Maybe he doesn't want to be with you anymore? Maybe, but even then, he would answer his phone. I, Tobias paused, hazel eyes staring past the nonchalant girl. Can you at least check to see if there's a Beck Coleman or Mo, Mo anything checked in here? Okay. The girl nodded and tapped on an old keyboard. Beck Coleman. She drawled, oh, yeah. There is a Beck Coleman here. Tobias sighed, can you call his room for me? If I call and he doesn't answer, he could be out of the room or sleeping or even in the shower. She warned as she picked up a corded phone receiver and put it to her ear. Tobias studied her fingers and shifted a few steps to the right to better see the square computer screen. He squinted, eyes darting back to look at the girl, reading her name tag. I understand, Cynthia. I'm just worried about him. Tobias shifted from one leg to the other, tucking his hands in his front pockets. He heard the phone ringing through her receiver. Once, twice, and continuing. She rolled her eyes and ended the call, dragging dull brown eyes to Tobias' face for the first time. Tobias winced. Can you, can you call again? I guess. She looked back at the screen and so did Tobias. He leaned in, adjusting the items on the counter. She pounded in the number again. 232. Tobias rolled his eyes around the room, giving the girl a tense smile and tapping his fingers on the counter. The phone rang again to no answer. Ah, uh, Tobias bit his bottom lip, could you, one more time? No. He's not answering, so I don't know what to tell you. Call him back another time. Like tomorrow morning. She glanced at the ceiling, huffing her annoyance. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. Frowning, Tobias stepped away from the counter. I'm probably overreacting and he's asleep. Thanks for your help, though. He continued walking backwards, bumping into the decorative fixture. He stumbled, blushed, and stepped aside for the rest of his walk to the exit. He rushed up to the limousine, tapping the tinted glass on Charles' side. Did you get anything? Yeah, the room number. 232, she give it to you? No, I looked over at her screen. Had her call up the room twice. It's pretty easy to chart three numbers and she wasn't paying attention. Sure. And how are we going to unlock the door? With a credit card. I'm going to walk, meet me at the room. Tobias jogged to the outdoor staircase, skipping every other step to get to the second floor. He browsed the exposed hall, turning a corner and continuing until he was across from the room. His heart jumped into his throat when he saw the nondescript door, faded images flashed through his mind of a similar door with gold-peeling numbers and water-stained edges. He lectured himself on what he could find, his bones vibrating with a plan A and a backup plan as he pulled a credit card from his wallet. He slipped it between the door and the wall, removed it and moved down to the lock. He wiggled the card through the tight space and jostled the door. He held his breath as he pushed the door open, coveting every new piece of knowledge. Icy air rushed out of the cookie-cutter room. Tobias' eyes went from the ajar side table to the rolling chair in the middle of the room to the billowing curtains. The first twin bed was empty of a human and stacked high with canvases, a duffel bag filled with paint beside it. Beck rested on the second bed, splayed awkwardly on his side. His legs dangled off the bed. Damp curls stuck to a sweaty forehead. Beck. Tobias darted over to him. He touched his steaming forehead first then hovered his fingers over Beck's nose and mouth, checking for breathing. Rapid puffs warm hair touched his skin. Tobias cradled his face, stroking his dry cheek. Beck. Is he okay? Charles touched Tobias' shoulder. And no. He's not. Call an ambulance. Fear colored his words, but his command was firm. Charles nodded and stepped outside. 
Tobias shifted Beck, setting his hips over each other, bending his legs at the knee and tucking one booted foot behind the other. Tobias straightened Beck's shoulders and gently moved his head, petting his cheek again. Beck. Tears welled in his eyes. I have the ambulance coming for you. The minutes dragged by, the clock ticking away seconds like hours and minutes like days. Tobias memorized Beck's features, the gentle slope of his forehead, the thick eyebrows framing his sunken eyes. His skin stretched over his high cheekbones and down to his cracked, dry lips. Tobias touched them and down his tight jawline. The sirens increased, the circling noise blaring into the hotel room. Two people entered with a stretcher, introducing themselves to Tobias and requesting him to step back. He obeyed their floating voices and they lifted Beck to the stretcher, promising Tobias the boy would be okay. He followed them into the ambulance where they checked his blood pressure, attaching him to machines to chart his pulse. As one worker stabilized Beck, the other asked Tobias questions. Tobias answered what he knew until they got to drug use. He stammered a response, saying Beck was an artist and he had a friend who was an artist and shrugged haplessly. They went from the ambulance to the hospital, directly to a room with doctors and nurses swarming around them. Beck was stabilized again. The doctor explained severe dehydration and overheating and if he hadn't been in a cold room, he would have been a lot worse off. The doctor clapped Tobias' shoulder, and Tobias sank into the only other chair in the room, lulled to sleep by the rhythmic beeping of the monitor. Charles stopped in, bringing Tobias a coffee and a hug and encouraging him to leave for clothes and a decent bit of rest. Tobias left and returned within three hours, resuming his perch in the uncomfortable guest chair. He covered himself with his mother's old blankets. Beck woke once after several hours with a sputtering breath. Tobias called the doctor who checked Beck's vitals and sent him back into a deep sleep with regulated sleeping medicine. Beck slept for twelve hours before he woke again. This time he stumbled to his feet, disappearing in the attached bathroom to urinate and attempt more, leaving the bathroom door open. He trudged back to the bed and was in a deep sleep again. The second day, Beck's body temperature was normal, and his organs were normal. Out of the weeds, the doctor looked into Tobias' bloodshot eyes. Can I speak with you, Mr. Coleman? Why yeah. Outside, please. Yeah. Tobias followed the doctor out of the room. What's up? Well. He's stabilized and able to be released after a few more hours of observation. We found high levels of methylene dioxymethamphetamine and caffeine and a low level of lysergic acid in his bloodstream. Ah. Uh. Oh, wow. Sorry, in layman terms. I found MDMA and LSD in his bloodstream, indicating he took MDMA within 36 hours of intake and the LSD less than 3 hours before intake. The doctor flipped pages on a clipboard. Upon intake, he was severely dehydrated and suffering a heat stroke. This you already knew, I assume? Yeah, sorta. But he's okay? Yes, his organs are performing normally. There can be a long recovery time for heat stroke patients, but he is no longer dehydrated. His food intake has been low since he's been here, but generally MDMA users have a suppressed appetite. When he wakes, I think it would be beneficial for you both to speak with an on-staff drug recovery specialist about options. Yeah. Tobias shuddered. What are the options? I mean, what do you think is best? The main two options are an inpatient facility or an outpatient facility. Given Beck's history, I believe an inpatient facility is best for him. It will provide him with around-the-clock support in a temptation-free environment. After inpatient care, he can continue treatment in an outpatient setting or with his previous therapist, if he would like. Inpatient facility, Tobias trailed, glancing in the room at the sleeping boy. Because oftentimes these sorts of drug use problems accompany mental disorders, and it can be difficult to re-establish sobriety without intense therapy. It will also give him time to decide his values before having them challenged again. Right. They can be expensive, but they provide a lot more than 24-hour care. The inpatient facility has a minimum stay of a month and includes a family program so you and him can mend your relationship moving forward. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your help. No problem. 
You can call a nurse when he wakes up and you both are ready to discuss options. The doctor bowed to Tobias. Tobias stood in the doorway, arms folded, as Beck stirred from another long sleep. He approached the crisp white hospital bed, kissing Beck's forehead and rubbing the rough cotton of his blue hospital gown. Beck's sleepy eyes fluttered and looked up at Tobias. Recognition dripped into his soft green eyes. Hi, Beck whispered, voice raw from lack of use. Hey. How do you feel? Tobias pet his dark curls, a light smile touching his face. Weird. Bloated. Sleepy. Good. I missed you. I missed you, too. Beck's eyelids fluttered. Why am I here? The doctor said he found a bunch of drugs in your system. MDMA, caffeine, and a little LSD. Oh. I guess. I took a few pills. Yeah. Tobias schooled his expression, staying calm as he continued touching Beck, cradling his face. Was Mo with you? She was, is she okay? Did she get sick, too? No, baby. I haven't seen her. I found you alone with your art supplies. Oh. Beck teared up. I'm sorry. About what? F for this. For being mean and terrible. Ah, you're not either one of those things. Tobias stretched over him, pressing his lips into his forehead. I'm glad you're okay. How did you find me? Well. Both of us have basic GPS tracking on our phones because we're in a family network together, the same thing allowing us to share games and music. I, I looked. I'm sorry. It's okay, but then what? I memorized the room number after I had the girl dial the room number a few times. You didn't answer, but the room numbers are the same as the phone line number so, yeah. Then, I used a credit card to open the door. Tobias flushed. H. How did you, A. Eh? My mom. She used to accidentally lock doors and I'd have to unlock them for her. You can use bobby pins on doors with keys, but overall a credit card is the easiest way. Ah. Gee good to know. Baby. We have to talk about what you want to do when you come out of here. Yeah. The doctor said you had two main options. Inpatient rehab and outpatient rehab. Well, three, because I guess you could do nothing. And no. I, I don't want to upset you and scare you. I don't want to be in the hospital again. Beck sat up, holding Tobias' hands. I want to do what you think is best. I can't, I can't make the decision for you. You decide what you think is best, but I'll tell you about them. Then you should rest on it and decide later, okay? Frowning, Beck tilted his head down. Okay. The doctor says the inpatient will give you the best chance for success. The inpatient is like a longer hospital stay. You'll be in a controlled environment with people there focused on helping you get better. They have family therapy and they can help with other issues you are having besides the drugs. The minimum stay is a month. A month is a long time. H. How far away is it? I didn't ask, but I'll be up to see you as much as they allow. So will Charles and Smash and Tiger, you know. Yeah. What about the other one? The outpatient? The outpatient means you'll be back at home and going to an intensive therapy program. It still has the family therapy and the other therapy programs, the main problem is, well, the environment isn't controlled. The doctor says anyone can do well in both, but the inpatient gives you better chances. Tobias squeezed Beck's hand. I want to go back to seeing Deborah. I think she'll be happy to hear from you. We can call her once you decide what you want to do. For now, think on it and get some more rest. The doctor says you'll be released in a little while. With another kiss. Tobias retreated and slumped back into the hospital chair. He kept a comforting smile on his face until Beck's eyes fluttered closed again. Keep reading for an exclusive excerpt from Ultimate Release, Book 3 of the Freeing Beck series. Part 1 Tobias dropped Beck's bag just inside the front door facing the winding staircase and picked up Beck, carrying him over the threshold. Beck giggled, wrapping his arms around Tobias' neck, kissing and nuzzling his jawline. Welcome home. 
Tobias purred, setting Beck on his feet inside patterned rug in the foyer. He kissed Beck's forehead and his lips. Thank you. It's good to be home. Beck rubbed Tobias' shoulders, hands sliding down his arms and fingers lacing with Tobias. He stood in front of the man, smile growing, brilliant green eyes glittering. Soft fingers pet Tobias' warm skin. Tonight, it's just me and you. Tomorrow is the appointment with Deborah and a party the boys wanted to throw for you. It's a surprise party. You've ruined the surprise. You can still act surprised. Tobias hinted, so, ah, uh, what do you want to do? Tobias rolled his shoulders forward. Honestly? Get in bed and sleep. I've missed being home and I didn't sleep well at the rehab center. Can I sleep in your bed tonight? Beck pulled Tobias close to him again, their bodies meshing together. He released Tobias' fingers, walking his own back up his shoulders and resting his palms against Tobias' neck. He urged him forward and stood on his toes, pressing their lips together. Beck opened with a gentle introduction, his soft lips sweeping across Tobias. To the left and then to the right. He hesitated for a moment, lingering with their lips barely touching before pressing into Tobias again. Yeah, sure. Tobias moaned softly, rooted to his spot at Beck's expert touch. Beck stroked Tobias' set cheekbones, his hard jawline. He slipped his fingers between their lips as Tobias' tongue requested entry into his mouth. Beck quirked the corner of his lips up as he ended the kiss, leaving Tobias growling. Tobias kissed Beck's fingers, harnessing his desire with a slow shiver. I'm going to go lie down. Join me later? Beck teased Tobias' full lips with the soft pads of his fingers. He slipped away, stroking Tobias' broad chest as he moved past him and upstairs to the master bedroom. He enveloped himself in the scent he'd missed for a month, falling into a deep sleep within minutes. Beck slept through dinner and on into the next morning. He woke up wrapped in Tobias' arms with the larger man's head tucked between his shoulder and the fluffy pillows on Tobias' huge bed. Covers bunched between their shoulders and their tangled legs, feet exposed to the elements. Yawning, Beck rolled to face Tobias, kissing his sleeping face and stealing private images of pure vulnerability. He traced the sharp angles of Tobias' face, showering him with more feather-like kisses before he slipped from his arms and into the bathroom. After a utilitarian bath and self-care routine, he emerged to find Tobias sitting on the corner of the bed, rubbing sleep from his eyes. Hi there, Beck smiled. I have therapy in an hour. I almost had to wake you. Wrapped in a towel, he approached Tobias, settling in his lap and kissing him good morning. Tobias tasted the minty toothpaste on Beck's lips. HMF, Tobias grunted, wrapping one arm around Beck's back. AW, so sleepy. Want me to wake you? Beck rubbed bare legs along Tobias' legs, waking his body up before his mind. Beck touched the crotch of Tobias' pants and pressed his hand into him. Hum. Tobias spread his legs, giving Beck's roaming hand more access. The hand moved away, nails kissing the insides of Tobias' thighs on its retreat. I think you're awake now. Get dressed. I will make cereal. With a kiss, Beck buzzed around the room, throwing on a shirt and stepping into a pair of jeans. He left Tobias once he heard water running in the bathroom and he went downstairs, pouring dry cereal into one large bowl and one small bowl. Beck didn't pour milk over the cereal until Tobias descended the stairs. They ate in comfortable silence, Tobias pouring himself seconds and Beck rinsing his spoon and bowl. Tobias swirled the bright rings in the faintly pink milk, finishing the cereal and bringing the bowl to his lips for the milk. Beck slipped into his heeled boots and Tobias laced sneakers on his feet. Checking his pockets for his wallet and cell phone, Beck wandered down the sidewalk to the car. Tobias climbed into the driver's side, the relaxed silence from breakfast followed them to the therapist's office. The drive was a slow twenty minutes and they turned into a neighborhood with eccentric modern homes. His therapist's home was only four houses into the strange neighborhood. Tobias made a U-turn and blocked the driveway shifting the gear from drive to park and looking at Beck. The covered carport and long driveway shielded them from the window-clad front of the house. Tobias kissed Beck's cheek, bidding him a good session. Beck smiled at the kiss and the well wishes, promising to return in an hour as he climbed out of the car.
Deborah greeted him at the door before he had the chance to ring the bell. Hello there. She smiled, come on in. There's bottled water on the counter if you'd like one. No, thanks. I'm sorry about not calling before, by the way. I just, yeah. We'll talk about it. Oh, of course. You seem well. She led him to the therapy room, closing the door behind them and motioning to the familiar couch. Beck collapsed on the couch with an easy sigh, taking the one pillow into his lap and curling up. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I got home from the rehab place last night and it was just Toby and I. How did you like the rehab place? It was, it was good. I liked having no distractions while trying to get better and I learned a lot about myself. Ah, I learned I will probably always have a problem with wanting to take a break from reality, be it drugs or other things you can be addicted to. Deborah nodded, easing into her cushioned chair and crossing her legs. Those are good things to know. I agree. I had therapy twice a day, recreational activities, three square meals where the anorexics made us all sit at the table for two hours each session waiting for them to finish their last four peas and bite of cornbread. Beck batted his dark eyelashes, head tilting to the side. It was nice to meet others coping with difficult things. Did you talk about your past? A little which was nice. I don't want to tell people because I don't want sympathy, but it feels good to admit what happened and not hang on to it, you know. Relieving to be open about it? Yeah. And not pretend it never happened. No one is asking you to pretend it never happened. I know, but, Beck frowned, thinking. I know but in an effort to be normal, you pretend like you had the white picket fence and 2.5 dogs as a child and it takes a lot of energy to pretend to be happy. It does. Did your therapist talk to you about depression? Yeah. We talked about brain disorders, both depression and anxiety. He asked me questions about how I feel. I think we decided therapy, for now, was a good avenue for me. Maybe pills later. I'm hesitant to start pills. Why? Because of what just happened. Ah. Reasonable. Along with pills, you can practice behavior therapy with depression. The therapist talked about behavior therapy, too. We talked about reviewing negative thoughts and replacing them with positive thoughts. Deborah nodded, exactly. Have you tried this method? A little. It's difficult. It is, especially when your brain or an outside force has told you you're not good enough for your entire life. Right? Ah. Uh, I'm working on it. Toby helps because he's not a negative person, but sometimes it's hard because he doesn't understand. His brain doesn't pull up randomly negative thoughts just because he's breathing. Because he's simple, which is okay, but he doesn't read. He runs. Deborah chuckled, sometimes simple is nice, though, isn't it? Beck smiled, okay, yeah. Simple is kind of nice. Ah, I missed him so much at therapy. I was surprised at how much I missed him. Why so? Because he's one person and, I don't know, I've never had to miss someone. I miss my best friend from before and the comfort of my previous life, but it's different. My heart ached while I was away from Toby. Ah, I see. A good ache? I think so. I wasn't obsessive, I was able to take care of myself, but I missed him. Deborah tipped her head forward with a smile. Good. So, she sipped her tea. What's the plan for school? I'm going back. Beck shrugged. My professors allowed me to take remote versions of my finals or substitute an essay, so I passed everything. I submitted some of my previous work for my drawing class. It was unconventional, but with the circumstances. Beck's words trailed off. Awesome. Are you excited for the next semester? No. I'm nervous. I don't want to see Mo because of what happened. Understandable, but you could potentially run into her? Yeah. We're both art students and the department is small. She could be in my class again. I don't want to talk to her and I don't want to confront her, or it'd be awkward. Why would things be awkward? Because she left me in a hotel room passed out and didn't even call Toby. She just, she left. 
Beck pursed his lips together, struggling to swallow over the knot growing in his throat. How does what she did make you feel? Stupid. Stupid for trusting her and thinking she was my friend. Is there a way to know someone's a bad person before you spend tons of time with them? Like a negative qualities checklist? Not really. Well, there's no such thing as a checklist, but your gut helps you with these things. We call it a gut feeling dot. How do I use it? Deborah flashed a smile, you become in tune with it. Did you ever feel weird about hanging out with Mo? Did she pressure you into things? Yeah. I don't know if I would call it pressured because most things were fun, but I didn't always want to do them. We did these weekend art challenges where she'd insist we stay up for three days and make art. It was fun, but she wanted to do it every weekend. She's the one who gave me the drugs. Did you feel pressured to take them? Yes and no. She didn't tell me what it is. I guess it's my fault for not knowing drugs, but I don't know. Is it my fault for not knowing what drugs are and taking a random pill? Hum. Deborah watched Beck for a moment, what do you think? I think I should have asked more questions, but I didn't at the time and now I know. Good answer. She smiled. What is your plan? I'm going to focus on school work. I signed up for 18 hours, so I will be busier than last semester. The therapist at the inpatient rehab center suggested keeping busy as a way to combat the pressure of being sober. And maintaining a steady schedule and checking in. Those are all good ideas. I have two art classes and four regular classes. I am going to wait for a few weeks and then I might add volunteering, community service, or even a job to my schedule. I am going to be better at checking in with Toby and myself. Very good. It sounds like you set up a nice plan for yourself. I'm also going to resume seeing you twice a week, if you have the space available. Oh, I do. Our old schedule? Yeah. Beck fell silent, squeezing the pillow. She called you a therapist. It made me angry because I, I felt good after our sessions. She made me question it, like maybe for you it was about money and not helping people. Well, this is my job but I love what I do. HM, it's like Toby. Toby is a trainer, right? He loves fighting and I'm sure he loves training, but he gets paid for his work. True. You can do both. No one should work for free. And you're good at it. You're a good listener. Deborah smiled. Thank you. That's a high compliment from a client. Have you considered what you would do for work? HM. I haven't. I like creating art, I wish I could make it a career. Maybe teaching art? Or something to do with children? Oh. I know, if I can't just work as an artist, I remember in the inpatient facility, some people who were initially resistant to therapy were sent to the art room. I want to be able to decipher people's memories and feelings from what they draw. Oh. You have to have a degree in psychology. H.M. I could do psychology. I like knowing the way people think and what motivates people. I like to learn, too. I heard psychology is a lot of schooling. It can be. There's a lot to learn. You have to like learning to do psychology. I like learning. I will look into it. Beck sighed, leaning back on the couch. Can I talk about something personal? Of course. I want to get further with Toby, but I want to do it right. It's been over a year since we've been together, I guess, and I want to go further with him. I don't know where to start. We talked before and he said it was up to me, basically. All right. Do you like this arrangement? I appreciate him waiting for me. The thing is, Beck pursed his lips, I know I'm not supposed to like the idea of being controlled or being owned by someone, but I like the idea of it. I don't want him to tell me what to do all day or be mean, but the intimate part. The intimate part appeals to me. Okay. Have you talked to him about this? Not yet. I realized it recently. In the inpatient therapy? No, a little before, but I didn't sort it out until therapy. Well, I'm going to remove my therapist hat and give you friend advice for a moment. 
I think you should do something special for him instead of tell him you want more. Special. Like candles and roses? Something he would like, but yes. And back with my therapist hat, I want you to think about what it means to open this door with him. You are going to have to be open, especially with what you've been through. It's new territory for both of you. If you don't think you can be truly open with him, then you should wait. Yeah. You're right. It's not just what I want. If he's willing to wait for me to be ready, then I should be ready. Millimeter. Does my advice help? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Ah, I feel better having direction. I feel good. Perfect, because we're out of time. What's the focus? Keep busy, stay positive, and be able to communicate with Toby before you enter into a relationship. Perfect. Deborah stood with Beck and walked him to the door. Where am I with billing? You paid in advance for some sessions you never attended, so we're letting the money roll over. Next session is already paid, but after, you can pay a few sessions again. Okay. See you next week, he stepped back into the bright sunlight, walking down the path to Tobias' dirty silver hatchback and tapping the window. Tobias jolted awake with a groan. MMF, therapy over? Tobias rolled the window down. Yes, sleepyhead. Beck kissed Tobias and moved around, hopping into the passenger side. To burgers and school supplies for next semester. You have to buy supplies every semester? Yes. Beck rose his eyebrows every semester. Plus, this semester I'm taking painting and color theory, which also requires paint. One requires gouache and the other requires acrylics. School is expensive. It's why I didn't go. Tobias grunted. You didn't go because you can't sit still long enough to take notes. It's still expensive. Yes, baby. It's expensive. Beck combed through Tobias' hair. Their therapy ritual continued with Tobias asking casual questions about his session over a red and white checkered placemat and gourmet burgers. Beck ordered a plain burger and Tobias ordered something with both bacon and barbecue sauce. Tobias asked the same questions each time though the answers were optional. First, he asked what they talked about. Today, Beck's answer was himself. Then he asked did Beck cry? Laughingly, he said no. Last, he asked if Beck felt better. Smiling, Beck said yes. After their hearty lunch, Tobias took Beck shopping at the art supply warehouse for a full three hours as Charles, Smash, and Tiger prepared for the surprise party. Tobias pushed the cart as Beck threw item after item in the basket. They began their journey on the first aisle and Beck was determined to purchase one thing off every single aisle in the store. He picked up fresh charcoal pencils and graphite pencils, new erasers, and new pads of newsprint and drawing paper for his personal sketches. For school, he added the required paint colors in the finest acrylic paints and the finest gouache paints, a selection of brushes for the separate types of paint and replacement brushes for some of his older ones. Beck dropped a collection of canvases in the cart, too, a variety of small and medium sizes as indicated on the syllabus. He concluded his shopping trip by strolling all the aisles again in case he forgot something and, smiling, he followed Tobias to the register. He rocked on his heels as the total surpassed $100 and then $200. Tobias paid for the supplies in cash and Beck swooned, resting his cheek on Tobias' broad shoulder. With a few minutes to spare, Tobias took the longest route home, driving slowly to point out his favorite houses and his favorite parks and finally, finally they rounded to his driveway where Charles' limousine was parked beside Smash's car. The party was everything Beck could ask for from their three friends. It included pizza beers and iced tea, and watching reruns of famous mixed martial arts matches with Beck in Tobias' lap and the two younger boys detailing every play. They partied well into the night and all ended up passed out in the media room until Sunday morning when Charles roused them all for a lavish brunch.